Welcome to Jewish Cinematheque, where we meet some of the important faces involved with films that tackle aspects of the Jewish experience. Today I'm joined by writer, producer, director, Julia Mintz, whose documentary film, Four Winters, looks at Jewish partisans, men and women, who fled the Nazis to the forests. There they banded together in partisan brigades in order to engage their enemy by blowing up trains, burning electric stations, and fighting the Nazis in any way they could. During World War II, it's estimated that there were as many as 25,000 Jewish partisans. In Julia's film, we hear from a few of the last surviving partisans who relive their journey, sharing their stories of resistance. We're hunting Jews to capture us, and kill us. They killed my child and my parents. I was 17 years. We were Jewish boys and girls fighting against the Nazis. I managed to escape with my comrade into the woods. We were part of a network of sabotage shacks. There were groups living in hundreds of miles of wild territory. The pillow was the rifle, the walls were the trees, and the sky was the roof. I have to behave not as a woman. I have to behave as a soldier. When your life is depending on it, you learn everything quickly. Derail a train. It's beautiful to see it, to be part of it. The braveness, the courage, it grows from you, yes? We wanted to see Hitler with the Nazis defeated and stay alive. Four years in the woods, that's four winters. Julia's recent projects include Mr. Soul, Joe Papp in Five Acts, and Get Me Roger Stone. Her work has been screened at various festivals around the world and a whole variety of platforms. Julia, welcome to Jewish Cinema Tech. Thank so you. So tell me about the Odyssey, the how did you happen to decide to make this kind of film? Hmm. I've been making films a long time. I've had various roles on the films that you mentioned, uh, mostly in the producing side. And when I came upon this story, it was a, it was a long time ago, actually. I long time ago, meaning over a decade. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we went we premiered the film at Lincoln Center, so it was fi finished a few years back before COVID at the landed. Jewish Film Festival. Yeah, and. Um, that was fantastic, and then everything went dark. But yeah, it was over a decade, and the film was created upside down. We, in the sense that- Explain that to our audience. They don't know what that means. Well, you know, we were at 1159, as Michael Barenbaum said, you know, when we were setting out to do the film. I mean, we were talking to people who were really at the very aged years. I mean, some people were in their late 80s and early 90s. These and people being? The partisans the who partisans. we interviewed in the film. And so as soon as we could, as soon as I discovered this story and I wanted to tell it, you know, in between working on other films and writing other scripts and producing other things, I would, at the end of each project, I'd <laughs> grab, some, grab my gear and grab some buddies in the industry and we'd go and shoot another interview. And each time we, came upon someone else that we thought would be a good interview subject for the film, we packed up our gear and jumped on a plane and, you know, headed around the world and across the United States and people came in from Israel and, you know, we interviewed several dozen people for the film and um, it's crafted as a, you know, there are indeed eight 
partisans who tell the story, but it's really the dozens of partisans that I've interviewed and all the scholarly research. And it really is a choir, you know, it's sort of a collective memoir that was deliberately crafted to sort of tell the whole story of the partisan experience of the 25,000 or more who came to the forest. How did you identify them? How did you get their names? How did you track them <laughs> down? It's not as if they're, you know, there's a whole organization of, uh, of yeah. Jewish partisans. This, well, there's, um, there are beautiful networks within the survivor community of all different groups, and there's many ways that people stay connected, but there wasn't a magic button, you know, that I could press for finding people that wanted to tell their stories. Um, there are definitely places where the partisans can be found and their families at this point, you know, know each other. But for us, it was much more of a, um, it was just sort of the way the universe works. I mean, at one point, you know, I was on a set for another film and I asked somebody to run an errand for me and pick up a photocopy of something because we were actually waiting uh, it was a film I was producing out west, a great film about Pat Brown, um, Jerry Brown's dad and the- Former governor. Former governor, and I was working with uh, the daughters, um, Sasha and Hillary, and uh, we were on set. We were actually waiting for Dolores Fuentes, and I ran out to go do something, and I had someone do something, and they came back and they said, you know, my, fa my grandfather's a partisan, <laughs> and so that was how wow. I found one. And, you know, Michael Stoll, who, um, who was one of your key um, individuals interviewed. interviewed. Absolutely. Yeah. He, um, Michael, I tried to get him to talk to me for five years. and Michael I, is based where? Uh, he was in Florida and uh, summered in the Berkshires. And um, I kept trying and he kept saying no thank you. And then I Why? pretended. Why do I, you think he would say no thank you? Oh, many of them. Many, many people I reached out to said no thank you. And, and your sense of why they would say no? They just Because it's didn't terrible. Want to, it's terror. terrible to go back into this hell and remember what you had to endure and go through and all the losses and the agony of how you were forced to live a different life than the life that you were initially given. I mean, these are incredibly painful and difficult stories to recollect. They're not stories. This is their life. I mean, you know, we delve pretty deeply. These interviews go on sometimes for days, you know, a minimum of like six hours. You're sitting with someone and going very, very deep into their memories. And it's, it's very intense. It's very powerful. It's very... Um, it's incredible that each of the people that I spoke to were so generous to not just me, but to you, to every person who gets to see this film. I mean, this is a gift that was painful and incredibly difficult, and they chose to give it to all of us. So you're interviewing one of them, and clearly this must have had some impact on you as you're hearing the responses to the questions. No, How absolutely. did you deal with this? I mean, it, 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 your, it, is there any family background where you had people who were um, survivors or anything like that? Well, there's a lot of prongs to that question. Um, I think that for me, I always feel very grateful that I came to this film later in my career because I've been an art activist. I've made films about social justice and human rights and gay rights and civil rights and the freedom of artistic expression. You know, you mentioned the Joe Papp film. Um, Wonderful film, loved it. Thank you, thank you. That, uh, the directors, there was a co-directing team on that film and they did a beautiful job. I was on the producing team of that film and I think that the, uh, that film was very much an inspiration for this in terms of how the story was crafted. And, um, but, you know, I've spent my career telling stories of what I perceive as, you know, everyday ordinary people that really found ways to help shift history and under understanding of what we can be and who we can be. And in many ways, tikkun olam, I mean, they've helped to heal the world. They've helped to express and expand our understanding of each other. And I 
I've been deeply committed to that. So when you say how I came to this story, I was so lucky to come to this story at a time in my career where I understood sort of how this story fits into our collective human history and so much of what this film, I hope, offers us is a deeper understanding of each of our individual capacity for our own strength and our own endurance and our own grit to protect, defend, um, and stand up for what we know is right and righteous and human, you know, that we really have to hold on to that and, and recognize its fragility. And at the same time, enjoy, express, and be all that we can be because our lives are so precious, you know, it's such a gift. But getting back to that other question, you're sitting there and you're listening to this. Were you able, I mean, how were you able to respond as you're hearing both the, the humorous stories that you include in the film yeah. um, and certainly the, the beautiful moments as well as the horrors. Mm -hmm. You as a filmmaker, you know, you're not just sitting there, you know, with a camera. You're, oh, no, no, you're, not at all. I mean, when we sit down, we're much closer than this, <laughs> you know. I mean, there's times where we're holding each other's knees and um, we both have a box of tissues. And, you know, it's... I wish everybody could be a documentary filmmaker and have that opportunity to be there for someone else to really share their story so deeply. And I think that the commitment to stay present and to take on that is, it's really quite magnificent. I mean, it's incredibly painful to hear people's pain and agony. We all I mean, by the time, you know, by the time you're my age, <laughs> like we've, we've all endured things that hurt, you know? I mean, if you have an open heart, then your heart will hurt. And it's about going in and allowing that to happen because at the end of that, you're left with something so beautiful and so permanent. So yeah, it's complicated. It's good complicated, you know? It's, it's good work. Powerful, powerful. Let, let, me, let me turn to the question of resistance. You know, uh, in Israel early on, after the war, uh, there was a sense that unless you resisted with guns uh, and were f physically fighting the Nazis, then uh, you went to the death camps like sheep. Um, and then slowly but surely that approach sort of changed as people began to understand and listen to survivors, particularly after the Eichmann trial when Israelis really for the very first time heard survivors, listened to survivors. And here you have survivors who've made the choice to resist with guns and ammunition and grenades and blow up trains and so on and so forth. Um, do you feel that this question of resistance remains? You know, that these are the only people who fought. What about those who decided to fight in other ways? I mean, clearly that wasn't the thrust of your film, but did any of your interviewees touch on this? Uh, a brother who stayed behind to teach um, Hebrew uh, or to take care of his or her parents? Yeah, this is an important facet of what I was so grateful to learn about. You know, when we think about, and you know, I'm American, I've been raised here, and so I think I'd rather speak to what my experience is and what I've learned through this journey of interviewing people that were from all over the world. And, um, but what, one of the great discoveries of the work was that, you know, you set out to make a film and there's always surprises. But one of the things that I was so intrigued by and really began to understand was how definitively I had learned history from the lens of the perpetrators. And my imagery, and of course I'm a visual person, um, and I'm also kind of a crazy research person, but the inherited visual 
archive that I had inherited as a young person that was on the news and it was in the films was primarily shot by the perpetrators, was shot by the Nazis and their collaborators. And it was Hitler's lens. And so we perceived, I perceived, I'll speak from my own experience, but the, it was from that point of view. And then there was the point of view of the liberators, right? The American liberators, which was very confusing for me when I first understood that it was the Russians that came in and said, so, um, but again, it was the liberators lens. And so it was both the, the trauma and the terror of what they saw and what they needed to document in those final moments of where we were. So what I began to understand when I sat with Faye Shulman and I sat with these partisans was what I was actually seeing. And what I began to understand was when we see people like this turning toward the, away from the camera and we're seeing the downcast eyes and we're seeing the gestures of people getting into the trains, it was because in a flash of a moment, if you made eye contact with someone you weren't supposed to, if you looked wrong, you stood wrong, they'd pull you out, they'd shoot you in cold blood and the five people nearest to you or the five people furthest. So you had, and you know, the Nazis were brilliant with this. I mean, this was this collective responsibility that they mandated and persecuted. And so what happened was what you were seeing was a commitment to one another you were seeing the sheltering of the tribe, of their people, of their community. They kept families together and villages together and shtetls. And yes, at some points they mixed everybody up, but you know, they take everybody from one village and they load them onto the trains. You knew if you moved, you could be responsible for killing your neighbor or your mother or your sister or brother. And so these were very, very complicated moments in time. So what I began to think over and again was how misinterpreted the, the learning was. And that what I was really seeing in many ways was loyalty and love and protection. And I was seeing a belief in humanity because no matter what, you couldn't have possibly believed what was coming. And even to this day after studying this and learning it, I still can't believe what I see. And it was really, very, very beautiful to understand that I, I really had misinterpreted that. And I wish that all of us, you know, that are seeing this moment in time, you know, when we look at those pictures, look a little closer. And when you look at the pictures and you get to see them on the big screen, take a closer look because you're seeing is, please don't hurt the people that I love. Wow. So. Through the eyes of a filmmaker. Uh, you choose Faye Shulman. Uh, as one of your um, eight key uh, interviewees. Uh, yes. She was a photographer. So talk a little bit about her images yeah. and what she captured. I really enjoyed spending time with Faye. And, um, you know, in when, her leopard coat. I know. So funny, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wear a leopard coat. And um, I... You know, this I started long enough ago that Faye's images were not so prevalent. And uh, I actually didn't realize at the time that she wore a leopard coat. And I think when I showed up at her apartment, I was in my leopard coat. And I think when I left, I thought, I can't believe I'm wearing this. <laughs> and now I actually love wearing it. It's actually got a few rips. And I was like, I'm going to still wear it. Then. But um, yeah, Faye was extraordinary to meet and to spend time with, you know, and um, just, we went through a plethora of her images I and mean, we sat on the couch and we pulled things out. Images and that she, she took photographed. in the forest. Absolutely. How? So I know it's remarkable. Um, so when Faye, I mean, you know, Faye's written a book, you can kind of learn more of the specifics, but I think that the part that stays so important to the partisan story, and I want to sort of stay focused on that collective history, Please. because it's really what I'm worked so hard to tell and as fascinating as Faye is, I think that what was remarkable about what she was able to do was she kept her camera with her when there were moments where the partisan groups were celebrating or reuniting or when there was enough of a quiet space and time, she would unbury her camera, she would bury it in the ground, she would bury the plates in the ground when she went out on missions and then she would come back and unbury it. 
and she would take photographs. And she really was so devout. I mean, she was a young girl, 16, 17 years old, and she really felt so strongly that even if she didn't survive, she wanted these images, these photos to survive. And it's magnificent that she was able to accomplish that and to hear each of the individual stories about why she took each photograph. You know, this photograph was when I reunited with a friend who I thought had been murdered. And this photograph was when we finally crossed this edge of the swamp. And, um, you know, it was really incredible to just sit with someone and have them like you and me. You know, you sit and you tell people, oh, you know, it's a little nostalgic because now we do it on our phones, but you're like, oh, look here, this is this. And, you know, this was my friend and this little girl, the little girl that's in the poster, that was a little girl who Faye saved. And the partisans would not have children in the forest. I mean, Faye really fought to have that little girl stay with them for quite some time until she could put her in another village. And, you know, so that's why she took that picture. And I, I love that ragtag picture of this brigade. And it really represents how so many people from so many different backgrounds came together and were one uh, fighting against the steel of Hitler's armies. And Faye captured that for all of us intentionally and has left us this incredible record. And she explains more about that in the film, but yeah, it's very Each precious. Each of your interviewees shares something else very special and unique. Um, there were 25,000 Jewish partisans, as you posit in the film. How many of them survived the war? Any idea? Mm. You know, Do this, we have those mm. numbers? Well, now they say there's quite a bit more than that, and I believe it. Um, you know, I think I'll leave the hard nuts of how those analytics come together for sort of the scholars and the mathematicians. But what I will tell you is for every person that jumped from a train. For every person that ran to the forest, many were murdered along the way. There were, there was no way out. I mean, there was nothing that you could do that wasn't gonna put you against your own death. And how those numbers translate from the stories I've been told by dozens of people um, there were so many that never made it to the woods. You know, they might have been part of the resistance in the ghetto and, you know, said so the partisans would go back to the ghetto. I mean, there was like this whole underground toward the end where they would go on these missions to bring people from different ghettos into the woods. And there was these efforts over and over again. And every time the partisans left the relative safety of the forest, I mean, the, the Nazis and, would come in, but they would go so deep in the forest and, you know, toward the end or the last couple of years, they began to understand their footings. But when they left the forest, they went back into the ghettos, right into the territories of where the Nazis and the militia were, you know, they were risking their lives. And when they would go to bring people out, if those people were part of the underground and were trying to get to the forest, they didn't all make it. So. How do we count these numbers? I mean, these are, these are very, very difficult statistics, and I know that often they lean deeply on the conservative side. In the film, story is told of uh, revenge killings, uh, the Pole who informs on a family member and, and then is picked out and shot and killed uh, by the partisans, uh, the partisans who come in and save an entire community, pull them, pulling them out of the ghetto. Um, uh, how did you, I mean, you must have hours and hours of interviews. How did you call and make the decision of what to include in a, mm. in a film like this and what to exclude? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll tell you, you know, one of the best things about, not, I don't know, one of the things I love most is, you know, you do these interviews and I'm old school, so I like to print out every transcript and then put them in three ring binders. And they're <laughs> motherships of binders, you know? And so I have binders, 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 binders. And so every interviewee has binders. And, um, and then, you know, I, I go through and I select the, um, the pieces and the bites that I, I wanna bring into the film and how they're gonna get intercut to tell this collective history. And, 
you know, from the infancy of the film, I knew that as much as the brilliant scholarship on the subject informed the work, I knew it was just going to be in the partisans' voices alone. I wanted them to tell their own story. And every interview that I conducted, I did have, and I would always do this for a film, really, you know, you have your ideas and you have your questions, and many of mine were thematic more than, I wasn't looking for like a specific answer, you know, what date or time or year. It was much more about, you know, breaking the Ten Commandments. Now, it wasn't as transparent as that, but I knew that I was very interested in going into depth about what a person had to do in order to survive, because I think that this is something that would speak deeply. I know this is something that would speak deeply to me, like how far would I go for my own survival? And how would I keep my faith and my own humanity when what it took to survive, I would have to really unpack all of that and then figure out how to <laughs> repack it. And so this, this human exploration of someone who's a victim of a genocide is sadly not just limited to the Jews of World War II. And I think that this is a global story for those reasons. But as we, as we navigate the um, transcripts and the interviews and what to keep in and what to keep out, even though some of the stories are very personal, there's stories about you know whether you're going to choose to eat pig or you're gonna choose to honor um, different aspects of your faith or choose to take certain risks or I don't want to give away the film. Right, so, don't give away but, the you film. Know, there's, there's, or there's have those a relationship. Yeah, like there's these, um, so these are very important themes and what was your role and how did you do it? And you know, so then weaving those together and the way the film is crafted is, you know, these individuals who lived this history collectively tell you what that experience was. And I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the best parts of the film is that we worked so hard, I worked so hard to integrate the same story, but from very different points of view and very different outcomes and experiences. So that was, that was a goal and I'm happy that we were able to achieve that. No question, and you do achieve it. Um, independent filmmaker, you're not working for a television station, you're not working for a studio. You have to go out and seek your own funding. Um, a lot of people say, you know, we've had enough Holocaust films, let's do something else. Mm -hmm. What was your experience in just, I mean, movies cost money yeah. in, in raising the funds that were necessary to make this film? Well, I can tell you that when, you know, documentary filmmakers. It's a tough life. A, yeah, well, I don't know. Yes, it's a blessed, it's a blessed life too. You know, it's, um, it's not blessed with uh, dollar signs, but or zeros after decimal points. But it is, uh, it's a choice, you know. I mean, I've been an art activist. I've been a storyteller, a documentarian since I began in my career. You know, it's a couple decades now. And... Um, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. <laughs> I really wouldn't. Uh, in terms of the funding, yeah, we need, we need people to believe in us and we need those people to believe in us in the beginning when we say, I have an idea and I, I have a dream and I really want to pull this off and we have to find the people that believe in what we want to say and do and that is a challenge. It's a challenge. It continues to be a challenge. I mean. As you mentioned, I am fully independent. I mean, this film was this film was made in my attic, and then it was made over my garage. And uh, I've made a lot of films in New York and L.A., and this one was not made, uh, you know, in the studios of where many of the other works I've done. So, but the upshot of that was is I got to craft this film in a way that I really wanted to. And I didn't have to use scholars to further sort of explain or articulate. You know, I really had free reign to create the film that I believe the partisans wanted and that I wanted to create. Oh, and I do want to tell you something. Please, tell me. So um, it is true that the, most of the partisans aren't with us, but 
uh, Shalom Yaron and Chaya Pilevsky were really instrumental in helping me craft my script and um, I would check in with them and I would call them and Chaya would be like, okay, I'm going swimming, but I'll be back. I can talk tell to me you later. These, tell me who these people are. These are people, well, Chaya is actually in the film. Uh, Shalom Yaron, um, he ended up not being able to be one of my main characters in the film, but his story and his resiliency and his brilliance deeply, deeply inspired me and informed the, the trajectory of the storytelling. And um, having that opportunity to really work with them as the film was getting scripted and some of my early rough cuts was really lovely. And then um, Michael Stoll, who's still with us, I, One of your interviewees. Yeah, and Michael got to see the film. I brought it to his house, and um, we did a private screening, and his granddaughter was here, and his daughter was here, and he kept saying, this is what it was like. This, That's what, look, that, how'd you do that? That's how that's how. And I sat there, I was so grateful. I was so grateful that we probably, got it right. Probably that was the best. That was the best, and then when it was over, he said, this is like Fiddler. Everybody should see this movie. <laughs> Not the hundreds lining up outside a film festival to see the oh, film. Oh, no, no. And by the way, the film was awarded uh, Best Documentary at the Toronto Jewish Film Festival. It was. And it has also uh, received accolades all across, uh, all across the world. Yes. Uh, the yes. <laughs> so excited about that. The film is called Four Winters. The reason why it's called Four Winters is... Four Winters in the Forest. Four Winters in the Forest. Check it out, it's worth seeing. And thank you so much for joining us, Joy. Thank you, thanks for having me.